uh, the true reality of this earth. I am the hijacker. And today I got a special guest. And as you know, I only talk about the most important things. I take you to the highest, the highest mountains possible uh, of our understanding of what's going on. And so today I've got Paul of Understanding Conspiracy. Um, uh, he's got an account on YouTube, very popular. Um, in fact, uh, as a Christian, I'm starting to notice this topic that we're about to discuss is actually starting to create a maybe a theological, ideological, but it's creating some type of civil war within the Christian community over what we're about to present to you. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I want to welcome you, Paul. Um, how are you doing? And it's an honor to meet you. I've, read, I've, I've listened to all your stuff, so I, I know you very well. Oh, well, no, thanks for having me. It's, it's great to be here, guys. I'm looking forward to uh, getting into this with you guys today. Like you said, it's a pretty, it's a pretty controversial one. Um, I'm not claiming I have all the answers when discussing this, this theory. But as somebody who's been in the conspiracy game for over 10 years, this is the new hot topic, I think, which is about to take everything by storm and is certainly going to shake up a, a few foundational beliefs for a lot of people. Um, and I'm hopefully today, maybe I can or we can get into some extra information you might want to share with me. I do believe you have some information to share with me and and I'll share with you guys what I know so far about this idea. And it should be a good one. Yeah, like I said, I've got 50, 60, maybe 70 pages of notes. And what I wanted to do, um, because you can you can handle a mic and you can literally talk for an hour, Paul. So what I want to do is like, you know, short burst of giving you my take on it and then you comment on it. And that way we can just start ripping through all of these notes and information. So we at least get them, you know, uh, we get them recorded because um, uh, most people don't know, but Paul has got a book, The Nephilim Look Like Clowns. Um, and his whole thesis is, is that when you see a clown and you see the type of makeup and uh, the, the, the large mouth and the lips and the red nose, he's basically saying that uh, in this other dimension right now in which um, a lot of people have used uh, magic mushrooms, or I, I, Isqua, Iowa. I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. That's the one. Yeah. Ayahuasca. That's it. Yeah. Um, they say when they go into that dimension that they also start to see jesters and court and, and, and uh, Nephilim that look like clowns as well as snakes. And so he's got a book he's writing right now, and you can actually pre order it. Uh, just got to go to uh, understand understanding conspiracy. Uh, uh, and he's got a YouTube channel, so you can get a hold of him uh, that way, uh, and he can give his you uh, his um, email soon. Um, but I wanted to basically mention to the audience out there that unless these guys are able to make some type of living, and Paul's actually got a book he's in the middle of writing. Uh, unless they're able to, to sell it and, and stay in the game, these guys come and go. They'll, they'll, they'll come on, and I, especially in the political realm. Uh, I've seen a lot of guys. They just don't have the support system. Uh, the only reason the Revolution Radio is the number one radio station, at least in the United States, and it, technically since we're listener supported, that would be a classification by itself. That would be worldwide. is because we do have a base of support. We do got an audience that actually gives money. Uh, and in Paul's case, he's got this book uh, coming up. And I think you're going to pre-sell it or you're in the middle of pre-selling it. Before I turn it over to you, Paul, my little story is that the reason why this, this is when I first got on this subject of the millennial kingdom. I tripped across the Nephilim look like clowns. And when I was 12, uh, going on 13, I was a kid. I was starting to do drugs, I come from a large Irish Catholic family, and my brother Chris, about three years older than I, he came over one night, and they had this cup of tea, uh, it was a big giant cup of tea, about 20 ounces, and what I did, uh, my brother says, you know, you, you, uh, uh, you ought to try this out, Timmy, he was turning me on to drugs, starting to drink wine, stuff like that, 
uh, fair, fairly young, broken home. Mother died when I was five. So we were, we were already shot up. So I went ahead and drank, tasted like crap, this tea, uh, about half of it. And then my brother, he got up and went to the bathroom. And this other guy that was with him was older. I never saw him before, never saw him again. Anyway, so I'm sitting there, at the, you know, at the table. And he goes, you know, if you drink the rest of it, you'll get a better buzz. So stupid 12-year-old kid. So I drank the rest of that crap. Well, what I drank dwarfs magic mushrooms uh, and ayahuasca. Uh, it's called Jimson weed. And it's probably more of a poison than anything else. And so within a few minutes, this guy get up, my brother came back, this guy left. And then I first noticed my hand made a trail and I went, wow, look at that. And then the hell started. I went into literally a 48 to 36 hour trip uh, mm -hmm. into a completely another realm, very bright colors. Um, my brother like turned into a werewolf on me. I started freaking out. Uh, and then, of course, then the cops came over. I don't quite remember them. Six of them had to string me down to a gurney. And all I remember is they had tusks like boars, brilliant colors all over. I saw all kinds of demonic stuff. Went into the hospital, same thing. And two or three days later, I came out of it. And it mu I must have had such a wild trip. And I can remember a lot of it, but a lot of it I can't, that the nurses and orderlies came in. Uh, and the doctors and they just wanted to see if i was like back in my right mind because <laughs> uh, i was so so far gone crazy so what i'm saying is that i went to that dimension i saw these gestures he's talking about i saw human beings that had boar's head huge tusk uh like i say my brother literally turned into a werewolf and so when paul started talking about that i says yeah i've got to I, i've got to listen to this guy because I, I know about that. Now, I've done LSD after that, but never knew magic mushrooms, nothing compared to that that Jimson weed, uh, which the farmers call it local weed. In fact, when they find it, they have to tear it up so the cows don't eat it and go crazy. But with that being said, before we start on this millennial kingdom, Paul, how can people get, uh, I know you can pre-order the book, but where's your contact information, numbers, anything? Uh, uh, about the book, uh, the Nephilim look like clowns. Go ahead. Sure. So the the main body of my work on on that theory is something I started in twenty sixteen in October twenty sixteen, just after the, uh, the the clown sightings that kind of scared all of the northern hemisphere, where people were uh, dressing like clowns on creepy street corners, you know, and scaring everyone half to death. Well, um, that sparked a, a a theory in my own mind, backed off my own research into nephilim history and biblical history and uh, yeah so so right now if you want you can go to my channel there's a playlist there called the nephilim look like clowns on my channel and there's about um 45 episodes dedicated to visually explaining this theory and um, it goes deep i know what it sounds like on the surface believe me i do but it's a lot more serious than than it, it initially sounds um and it really is an exploration of of how the demonic works and how that realm works and how the beings there operate it's, it's basically a handbook of the know your enemy is basically what i'm writing um the book is of the same name the nephilim look like clowns you can find all information for that in any description of my uh, nephilim look like clowns videos all the links are in every video description i make that take you to the gofundme where you can support the book and pre-order a copy which will be signed and sent to you by myself once published. Um, I am up to chapter 17 of a planned about 30 chapters, so it's it's steadily on its way. I'm hoping to have it published by the end of the year or maybe early into next into the next year. Um, it's going to be a thick tome of, of biblical history and of uh, an examination of ancestor spirit worship cultures all around uh, the earth that venerate the Nephilim by also dressing in clownish features. And it's also a, a deep dive into secret societies and their involvement with all of this as well and how they were actually involved with creating the costume of a clown, which is used for the same purposes as these uh, cultures around the world who dress like a clown to channel the Nephilim. So yeah, um, all the links are in any video you can watch on my YouTube channel. If you're interested, you can also email me directly at understandingconspiracy at gmail.com.
Yeah, and they can also pre-order, right? Absolutely, right, absolutely. Go to the GoFundMe. Um, any donation that's over a hundred pounds will get you a free signed copy of the book once published. That's right. And uh, pre-orders may end soon because I've already had about sixty pre-orders, um, and I may cap that at about seventy or so just to help me um, with with the with the, the the amount of work I'm going to have to do to get them out all over the world. You know, I might cap that soon. Um, but yeah, that that's certainly where you can go and pre-order. It's on the GoFundMe, and the links are in the descriptions of any video on my channel. Yeah, and also the um, uh, the images that you put, Paul. I have to tell you, um, just because I have been to that realm, uh, mm -hmm. a few of those images. I don't know how, if if AI makes them. I don't know where you got that stuff from, but a few of those images just almost made me have like PTSD or something. I mean, that's like I remember that. I, yeah. I, I think I've seen that. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've seen that before. <laughs> I mean, it's really uh, uh, it was really quite jarring. But, it is, uh, no, it is. It really is. And uh, to be honest, like I said, it, it's no joke. What I'm talking about isn't... I'm not talking about clowns to try and be funny here. It's actually really serious, the topic. And the images I, I provide on most of my videos and um, are actually real evidences of, of what these things looked like as shown through the artworks of many cultures all around all around the world, you know. But also, um, I have created for some thumbnails here and there, some some people have created AI-generated renditions of what they think they would have looked like in, in, in more of a realistic way. Um, and some of them are terrifying and very close to what I'm trying to say and uh, what seems to be the case through even ancient artwork depictions, which you can find, which are not AI-generated. But yeah, some people have created some AI-generated images for me to use as thumbnails. But the, I would say 98% of what you see on my channel is 100% real artwork and um, it, it's it's not fake. You know, I'm, I'm not making this up, let's put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. And for people to give you a, a word picture or a visual, uh, there's this movie, Constantine. So what Paul does, he takes you from a orthodox, pretty much orthodox Christian perspective. It's not like new age, Christ consciousness, you know, that type of thinking, but it actually opens up and shows you, takes you into this demonic realm, which is right among us. I can tell you right now, we, we're not able to see it. I don't know why, or thank God we're not, but it's, this realm is overlaid on our realm. So the movie Constantine with, um, uh, I don't know, that big actor, I can't think of his name now. Yeah, Keanu, Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So Paul takes you into that. So speaking about otherworldly things and things that are just so absolutely unbelievable, uh, we've come across this new thing that's starting to hit. Mm. Uh, and it's the Tartarian Empire, some people call it. Other people uh, interrupt the mud flood with it. Uh, other people say, no, no, this is a thousand year reign of Christ, which has already happened. Christ did come back. He did fulfill it. And so uh, when I started to get on this, this is the first thing that hit me. Um, number one, it's the lies. Other words, I've been lied to so much and I come from a geopolitical angle. And so I come out of that world. So when I'm looking into this whole new concept, almost a new theology, uh, I've, I'm coming with it with very jaded, very cynical. Other words, just think about the things we've been lied to and the things that we've gone through. I mean, think about the Y2K, um, the 9-11. Then, then we had the big 2012 end of the world thing. Uh, and then shortly after that, uh, it was the flat earth, the, the, the biblical shape. And when I hit that one and I realized, wow, these people even lied about the shape of the earth. <laughs> My God, I just couldn't believe it. And then we had, for, for some, the Mandela effect, where, you know, things that we remember changed. And then, and then the Tartarian Empire, the maps came out. We, we find out about the mud floods, where there, there seems to be either regional mud floods or uh, you know, continent-wide, or it could have been a city mud flood. I mean, the Bible does talk about the windows of heaven. So if, if a city like Philadelphia was just getting so wicked... Who's to say God couldn't open up a window above heaven and just just pour it like a spigot and that particular place would be mud flooded. But then we hit the, 
the uh, <coughs> we all know what that means. Uh, and then the millennial reign. And so as we're reading it, we're starting to realize, wow, they lied to us literally about everything. And Paul, I'll get you to comment. I'm taking it now because I've been so jaded and lied to by so many people, uh, the political world everywhere, mm. uh, and all the history that, that I am to the point now to where outside of math, like two plus two equals four, I'm starting to believe that we've been lied to, and this, this is going to bother some Christians, a lot of things, almost everything, almost all history. In fact, I am now finding out about there's been scripture and the holy word of God, which at one time I said, look, that's the inherent word of God. Every word is true. Now I'm finding out the name of Yahweh, Jehovah, has been taken out and substituted like 4,000 times with like Lord God. Chapters of Daniel, about the two dragons fighting at the end of Daniel, that whole chapter was pulled. The book of Enoch was actually in the original King James Version. That, that's been pulled. Another chapter in the book of Esther that also talks about the white and the red dragon. That one's been pulled. And now I'm looking at the Mandela effect and I'm thinking, and I, I've read my Bible like 40 times. I mean, I, I've, I know it. And I'm just thinking this stuff wasn't in there. I'm finding all kinds of stuff. So, Paul, you're dealing with somebody and some of your guests, they believe in historical columns and they got their reasons for it. But I'm to the point, Paul, I don't believe any of it anymore. I, unless I have empirical information, evidence, I'm not believing uh, any of it, except uh, Jesus is the only begotten son of God. He did die for our sins, mm -hmm. rose a third day, and we are saved by faith. But outside of that, I'm, where, where do you stand on, what's your belief system? How, many, how much lies, how much history? Where, where do you come down on that? Well, that's a that's a powerful question, and you know, I I'm, I'm I hope I can give you a satisfying answer for this, but I'm kind of in the same boat as you, to be honest. Um, because I followed you, what you did there was lay out the history of conspiracy over maybe the past twenty years, you know, and I've been there watching it with everybody as well. Watching, I I started the same process you did, you know, it starts with the political stuff, and you realize all the institutions have been lying to us about everything, including the medical, banking, entertainment, you know, whatever name an institution that they're all corrupt, and uh, that's kind of what people begin to wake up with isn't it you know they start to realize they've been lied to about all this basic worldly stuff and then i watched you know as each topic arose more and more proving that they have utterly lied to us about everything and i mean everything you know including like you said the shape of the earth uh, the cosmology of what, <laughs> what 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 we actually live on or within or and i'm not saying i know exactly what the shape is i don't i don't identify with any particular group on this one but i know it's it's certainly not what they've told us you know um, so that's one thing. And then, like I said, they had the Mandela effect turn up as well, which shows that um, reality is, is not as cut and dry as we think it is. And things do appear to be more malleable than we understand. Some pretty trippy stuff is going on with that. Um, and then when it, the next thing came out, and like I said, it was Tartaria, hidden histories. The timeline has been messed up. There's uh, evidences for ancient civilizations everywhere. That, And I've been there just with you, you know, and I've seen the same things you've probably seen as well. And I think a lot of listeners have been on the exact same journey that we've been on. And what I do on my channel is I comment on that journey. You know, I am a lot of my work is is examining what it is to be a truther and what the process is exactly and where the pitfalls are and what to look out for for new people who've joined and how to handle the information well because it can make you lose your mind a little bit and you can lose your friends and family in the process you know so i'm really trying to be there as a, as a helper for a lot of people to guide them through the process of being awake i'm not saying i have all the answers certainly not um but i i understand what it means to to learn these things and have your paradigms constantly shifted one after the other so i've been there and i've got to the point where like you i, I don't trust much I take everything with a grain of salt and I, 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 I like to, I kind of have a method for doing this, you know, for dealing with the truth. And it's when these topics turn up that really are huge, 
paradigm shifting topics the latest one being right now coming out of the tartarian movement which is a very new age gnostic line of alchemical thinking you know very secular view of of alternate history is now the christian perspective on the matter within the truth of culture and that's the millennial reign has already come and gone what i what i like to do with any topic like this is fully immerse myself in every possible angle this could go down and in which way it's going to work but i also make sure to keep a healthy arm's length distance and try not to identify with anything within it until i i i know enough because the problem is with a lot of these topics you know the information comes in thick and heavy in the beginning and a lot of people get swept up in topics like flat earth mandela effect tartaria millennial reign and they lose themselves to it they lose their identity to it and it becomes their entire life starts to revolve around it in ways which aren't really healthy i don't think and it makes them miss the life that's happening right in front of them through fear of these grand ideas. So I am careful not to fall into those pitfalls myself. So, But I, like you, I, I think we've pre- been pretty much lied to about everything. But one thing, like I said, I, I keep as a foundation, and this is only through personal experience because I've called on the name Jesus Christ and he has saved me. Um, and I, my life has changed since I gave myself over to Christ in 2014. I'm born again and I, I'm an ex-addict now. I've been sober for eight years and I'm a new person. I, you know, my, my anger, my hatred, my, my pride is gone. Everything's changed, you know. I'm no longer the person I used to be since I gave my life over to Christ. So I know there's power in that name and he is my saviour, you know, and I believe I believe the basic gospel, and I don't think that's ever changed for as much as they've tried to edit the Bible to, yeah, grow, to I grow agree. us. You know, I don't think the basic gospel's ever really changed. And I don't think wherever we are in the timeline, whether that's before tribulation or after tribulation and after the millennial kingdom, I don't think the gospel changes. And I think our salvation is still is still uh, secure in that as long as we believe that jesus is who he said he was and that he rose from the dead and that he paid for our sins with his sacrifice you know? absolutely absolutely so um yeah um so uh so here is the basic thumbnail thing about this millennial kingdom so jesus came uh, uh 30 a.d three-year ministry uh was crucified was raised from the dead and then uh around right around 70 AD, um, he kept saying to all his apostles, there's all kinds of scriptures, we don't need to go over it, but I'm coming back shortly. Those who pierced me shall see me come in the clouds. There's people standing here among us that will not see death. And then supposedly at 70 AD, uh, the Romans came, there was a big battle, supposedly Christ came in the clouds. People like Josephus said they saw it, but the the thinking is, is that that's actually when he came that was his second coming now there's other people they say no there's a 500 year break from that event to like uh 5 30 or whatever mm-hmm. which means you would have had to have five four or five hundred year old men walking around if, if what he said wasn't uh, true mm-hmm. so i'm not going to dispute what he said i'm going to pick it up right there when christ came back and this is going to be uh, a complete revelation to you paul this this may even actually change theology but what i'm proposing is that christ had a two-part ministry the first part was when he came and he was crucified uh, and rose from the dead uh that was just the, this primary mission so christ not only came to spiritually save the souls of those who would respond but here's the second part of his ministry Hmm. he had to come back to actually set his kingdom up or mankind would not have survived it think about what we inherited other words we now have the evidence of thousands of cities we have the old maps i mean castles and cities and mansions all the way from Honduras, Sydney, Australia, Africa, even in the Antarctic, we've got we've got civilizations and cities all over the place. So he not only did he come back to spiritually save the souls, but he had to set up his kingdom to basically physically put the infrastructure in the world. And I'm talking about all of these buildings, uh, hundred uh, thousands of cities hundreds of thousands of buildings, which about 90% have like been destroyed. Mm -hmm. Aqueducts, which we would know as the Roman aqueducts, 
canals. We now know that there's canals in China that were mud flooded and all they had to do is dig them out. The CNO Canal, uh, I think, uh, where's my paperwork? 360 miles, uh, locks, everything else. They were able to do like in eight years. Uh, the St. Lawrence Canal, uh, canals left and right. The, the, the Panama Canal, when they dug that out, they dug it out so far and so wide, and then they hit basically rock, which means that was filled in. So, mm. and then also think about the Star Force. So when you actually take a look at what Christ did with that thousand years, he literally built out the infrastructure of the world. Think about the, the great prairies, the, uh, the grand prairies in the United States, breadbasket of the world, the Ukraine, the breadbasket of uh, Eurasia, uh, several other places. Those places should have been full of trees, but they weren't. Mm. So we've got canals. And then we got star forts. These, these star forts were, were, were everywhere. Why did he put those in place? And so my thinking is that, and I, I'm looking at it from a geopolitical, when Christ came back, he says, well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to obey the first commands of my father, uh, the first commands that he gave to Adam, the very first words out of Jesus, out of God's mouth when he created Adam and Eve, the very first thing, he says, I want more, more men creatures. Go, go forth, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. I want more beings like this that can enjoy my glory. But what's the second thing he told Adam? Adam was pretty good at procreation, right? Uh, we, we, we know what we got. Hmm. But the second, the second command was go and subdue the earth, the creepy crawly things the gardens, the land, uh, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air. When Jesus came back, this is what I think, Paul. I think the world was like a Jurassic Park. I think it was so vicious. And Mr. Ono, I've talked about it. There's things like manacores. There are things like griffins, huge snakes. It could have been cannibal giants. But I believe that the whole world was so overrun and full of so many crimeras and different things that we we've all heard about that the first thing he had to do was subdue the earth and so what what do you think about that that as soon as jesus came back the first thing he's thinking is what did my father tell the first adam about subduing so and then i, I base this on that according to census there's only like a hundred million people supposedly in the first century the, the estimates vary, but it's basically 100 million to basically 270 million people. Those were the only people that, that was the best guess of the population of the earth. So what do you think about first, Paul, that he, he, he wanted to fulfill the father by subduing the earth? And then second, realizing that unless he put the infrastructure in, uh, that we, we wouldn't even have made it to this point. We, we we've been constantly at war. We, there's, there is no time in history which uh, something like that could have been done, except there was a thousand years in which there was a, like a massive, peaceful building campaign in which the whole earth infrastructure was built out to prepare for the sands of the sea, which that's what we are now. Go ahead, Paul. I'm talking too much. By no. the way, I stole the opening. I stole the opening from you. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was... Um... That's a great concept and viewpoint and speculation and theory. Absolutely. Um, in terms of, you know, you were saying just before his return, there would have been chimeras around. It was crazy chaos, genetic engineering going on, just a bloodbath of, of chaos, basically. Um, it's interesting. I mean, again, we shouldn't trust the historical record is what you're speculating and basing this idea off because that's not described as what was happening in, let's say, 70 AD and onwards, but, you know, um, or prior to that. However, it does say in Matthew 24, you know, in 30, uh, 24, 37, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man, you know. And you have to wonder what that means, because people point to that today, don't they? And they're like, when Jesus comes back with his kingdom, you know, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. People 
often repeat that phrase in conspiracy circles and they send the point to what's going on today it's like look they're, they're messing with genetic engineering you know they're uh they're creating human animal hybrids that's what was going on in the times of noah just before the flood of mankind you know the nephilim had corrupt and the angels had corrupted all of mankind and mankind was corrupting their own dna and it's described in the book of Joshua that that's what was happening there was the mixing of kinds happening and uh, the son of the son of god the sons of god the angels were teaching man this these these sciences these corrupted sciences you know which were really messing up humanity and i discussed a lot of this in my nephilim look like clowns work to be honest uh, laying the biblical foundation for the theory but uh what you're saying there may make sense that just before jesus returned if it's already happened you know and we're going off this idea that the millennial kingdom has already happened and been established then just before jesus turned up then yes maybe there were these chimerid monsters everywhere just as is explained in matthew that as it was in the days of noah so shall it be in the coming of the son of man you know and they he goes on to explain that people you know before the flood they were eating and being merry you know and sleeping and living normal lives and suddenly it came upon them and they didn't realize so you could there is obviously to make sense of that that is probably what he was more than likely referencing but the days of Noah was more than just people being really bad. It was people really seriously genetically messing themselves up as well. So we have to take that into account. And what you've just said there is fascinating, you know. And all the wars and all the wars that were oh, going yeah. on. In fact, uh, yeah, yeah, all the wars. Uh, somebody said, uh, I talked to the station manager and I asked him, since we've known the history of mankind, how long has mankind been actually at peace where there's been no conflict? He says, well, I know the answer to that. Of course, of course uh, uh, Mad Painter, he's, he takes more of a, it's like a spiritual source view of God. And he goes, it's only been seven years. In other words, there has not only been multi-conflicts in each particular geographical area, even continent-wise, but also empires. So he says, as long as man has been here, it's been nothing but wars one war after another whether it's a family war clan mm -hmm. whatever always wars and so that's when i ask him well where in the world are you gonna do you realize how much time it takes to put in an aqueduct or mm -hmm. it takes to clear the great plains or to build a star fort or to build it, all of these different buildings it is like a huge amount of time and resources and you could mankind could only do that if there was this period of a thousand years peace. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're common on that. Well, not, ju not, 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 just, not just time and resources, the, the know-how and the expertise and the perspectives as well, because you look at these things from the sky like we can do today, and you have to wonder how they got so precise with the laying of those foundations to make it so perfect, you know. Um, who had the knowledge to do these things? as well? Because as well? this is the thing, like we, we can barely recreate such things today. Even with our infinite resources and our supposed um, huge amount of, of smarts and knowledge and architecture and how it works and principles. They've only just rediscovered Roman cement, you know, Roman concrete, as they call it. <laughs> it's kind of, what do you mean? That, that technology was just lost, was it? That he wasn't passed down generationally as, as most things we're supposed to be are. It's, uh, it's, in, it's insane to think about when you actually look at these buildings and these structures around. You have to wonder who had the time and who had the knowledge to do these type of things. And what you're saying, you know, this idea that somebody had to come and lay the foundations of 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 what we have today, because we certainly couldn't have done it because we were too busy con constantly squabbling with one another and fighting one another. And it seems like the millennial, the millennial reign of Christ, people, a lot of people don't know this. They don't think about it like this because they've been given bad theology in, in churches. And they, they think when Jesus returns, it's going to be perfect forever. And that's it, done and dusted, it's the end. You know, there's no more to the story, basically. It's an infinite kingdom and it goes on and on forever and there'll be no more war and there'll be peace and happiness and sunshine. That's at the very end of time after the great white throne of judgment. That is not the millennial kingdom on earth. And I and people argue it's not a physical kingdom. It's all spiritual. His kingdom's not of this world, as he says, you know. And that's true in the end after he's established his kingdom on earth, it's kind of like a taster, a thousand years of Christ reigning on earth. He'll, he'll show you what it can be, what he can do and what his world truly is. But even, you know, it, get, it says Satan is released for a little season at the end of the millennial reign. And I think that's because humanity fought him every step of the way 
And it's what God does. He gives you over to your reprobate mind, doesn't he? If you sin constantly, God will give you over to that. And from what I can tell, the millennial reign was ruled with an iron rod by Jesus, as it's described. He had to keep people in line to stop them from fighting and killing each other. That's basically what it was for a thousand years. Him creating a physical kingdom on earth that was perfect in its physicality, but the people within it was still human. They weren't all perfected resurrected saints by that point. There were still humans around with a with a sinful nature who rebelled. You know, and they were constantly rebelling, constantly fighting one another, not making the pilgrimages to uh, to Mount Zion and f- to see him during his reign, and therefore suffering droughts, as is explained in the Bible. And we can see remnants of this today. There's huge swaths of the earth which are just dry, barren wastelands. And you have to wonder, are these pointing towards the regions in which the enemies of Christ still existed even during his own reign who refused to bow down and worship him and go and, you know, go and see the guy once a year and they suffered the droughts as it was explained in the Bible. So you, you can see these evidences with our, with our eyes. That Yeah, he said, he said I, come, I, I, I will go out with a sword and I will rule with a rod of iron Absolutely. Uh, during his reign. Because humanity needs that to be put in line and to be controlled because we are un- we are an unruly, violent bunch by our sinful nature, unfortunately, um, and which is why we need a saviour, which is why we need him. And I think it's it's uh, it's been said by people I've talked to, you know, humanity's story is a story of rebellion. You're like, look at Adam and Eve. We walked with God in the Garden of Eden. And what did we do? We disobeyed him. So why would it be any different when Jesus Christ rules here physically with a kingdom on earth right in front of us with our very eyes? Undeniably. Even when the Savior's right there, you know, we would still deny him. It still happened. And many people didn't, of course, but there was always that contingent who would. And I think it got to the point in the end where it's like, okay, so let's give these people over to the delusions then. Well, let's let them have the kingdom I've built let's see what they do with it. And what did we do with it? You know, if this millennial kingdom has come and past theory is true, well, we live, we are squatting in what he built. And we have probably corrupted the image of most of these beautiful buildings. We have failed to even come close to recreating anything similar to what he built. So instead, we've destroyed it all bit by bit systematically. And we've attempted to establish, what do we call it? A new world order. And that's what's happening today. Yeah. That's well, the world we live in. So, uh, so I, I've got on a bit there. I'll let you carry on. Go ahead. Right. Well, let, let's talk about, okay, so when Jesus' second uh, second coming came, uh, 70 AD, he knows he's going to rule for a thousand years. Mm-hmm. Let's say you're Jesus, I'm St. Thomas. And I said, Jesus, or, or Yeshua, what, what are we going to do now? What what's? And I think immediately Jesus would say, well, we're going to clean the earth up. We need to build the infrastructure so that ultimately, when my rule is over, there's enough resources and energy so that when these billions of people come through, they at least get a chance to hear the gospel. So uh, saying so he he knows that in a thousand years, you know, he's going to tell St. Thomas, look, in a thousand years, then the holy city, New Jerusalem is going to get moved. I personally think it's at the North Pole. I think that's the encampment of the saints, as it says in uh, uh, Revelations 20. Mm-hmm. He says, but, but then the, the wicked one, Satan is going to be released from the pit. Now, the first thing he's going to go for, he's going to go for two things first. He's going to go for all the books that we write, anything, any of the history, what happened during the thousand years. He's going to go for that which by the way, the Vatican has 53 miles of tunnels full of ancient old books, 53 miles. A whistleblower has come out and said, look, look there's places I can't even go in this, this labyrinth of tunnels under the Vatican. So it's gonna go for the books and it's gonna go for the church. And so Jesus knowing that, Jesus, I think he said, we have to do something which is gonna leave a testament that this kingdom has come. And I think, Paul, what the testament is, I think it is these these Greco-Roman incredible churches, cathedrals, architectures. We will leave these structures as a because we can't explain it. Hmm. I, I, you can't get a, you can't get a straight answer from nobody. And then they say, oh, they were built in 1820. It was built 1850. Well, we had the camera since 1826. And the first thing anybody does when they remodel is they take a picture. And yet 
no pictures at all, at all of any of these buildings being built when they supposedly stay, which is ridiculous. These are rich people. If they're going to put up an incredible structure like that, they're going to take pictures. But what, how, what do you think about my thinking that, that Christ knew the thousand years was going to be up, Satan was going to be released, and he wanted to leave like a testament through this incredible, beautiful, uh, un unbelievable architecture as a, uh, as a testimony. What, what, what do you think that you think that might have been part of this thinking him him thinking ahead, knowing that the little time of Satan was going to come? And, mm. you know, not only did we need the infrastructure, uh, the canals, the star forts, all the rest, but we needed to be able to see for ourselves, look, something's more, more than meet the eye. What, what do you think about that? That 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 was part of Christ thinking uh at the beginning of the thousand years well god set his commandments in stone and i think jesus would uh, probably set his testimony in stone as well which is what he did with these buildings likely i think it's a fantastic theory i think i think you may be onto something with that i think it's it's a brilliant perspective to, and th thank you for sharing that with me that definitely i think is is something we have to consider as a serious possibility um and yeah uh, and yes, here's, it's a here, good idea. here's the other one paul the other one is is if you actually take a look at the structures that the millennial kingdom built, what do you see? You see not only structures, they're all huge, um, but you see communal type living, which a lot of things have been turned into prisons or mm. insane asylums or whatever. You see buildings that could hold thousands of people. It's like uh, where they could all get together and worship and pray mm. or organs for music maybe even some healing frequency. It's like, if you actually take a look at the buildings themselves, they're meant for a, a, a people that actually have fellowship with one another. I mean, imagine a Sunday morning at one of these grand cathedrals where St. Thomas is going to actually come as a priest uh, in Christ's kingdom, and he's actually going to talk. And then also the buildings. It's like, Nobody builds buildings. Why, why Why? are the buildings so incredibly intricate, craftsmanship? It's like the people that were building the buildings are, are, are actually saying to themselves, well, I'm going to build a better cathedral than John down the street. I'm, build, I'm going to build the Lord something really special. And I mean, it's like the people that built this stuff, they weren't building for utility. They were building for the eyes of the king. That when my, my building gets dedicated, man, and I'm going to really show everybody up. I'm going to have seven arches, you know, and, and five towers or whatever. What do you think about that? That the very nature of the buildings show that these people were actually building something other than for mm. economics or for themselves. Go ahead. Oh, I, I agree. This um, utilitarianism was out the window during the time these things were built. These people, whoever built these, um, clearly had a knowledge and an ability and an eye for aesthetical detail far beyond whatever we do today. Everything we build today, like I said, is trash. It's quick. It's it's cheap. It's thrown up within a few weeks, and it's mainly made of metal and wood structures with a, a bit of brick around the outside. You know what we do today is not embellished in any real way, unless somebody's got the money to fund that and pay for that. Um, but it seemed like whoever was building these buildings in the past, everyone must have had a lot of money, <laughs> if by today's standards, to to pay for the un very unnecessary embellishments which are on a lot of these old, very old buildings. Absolutely, and you know. I I'm blessed that I live in England, which is full of, of uh, you know, cathedrals and very old buildings, which are only a, a, sh a relatively short drive away compared to America, you know. And um, I, I, I studied next to Lincoln Cathedral when I was getting my art degree. Um, for, for, for three years, I lived there. And, and I, I suppose then I didn't appreciate it as much as I would now with this new lens and perspective of possibility because... I recently went for my me and my wife's anniversary to visit Lincoln again because we actually went on holiday there not long after we first met, um, and you know we uh, we did it again now that we're married as like a one year anniversary type of thing as like a memory four years later, and I went to see the cathedral, and I for I just I forgot how awe inspiring the thing actually is until you're stood right there in front of it again. You know, and it hits you as soon as you, as soon as my eyes locked onto it, because you have to go through this um this old um, archway to kind of get a, a good a good view, you know, 
And once you're in front of it in the main court, right in front of it, and you're looking at this thing, my my eyes couldn't comprehend what I was looking at. It's it, it has a very psychedelic nature all of a sudden because there's just too much information for my brain to process into the details of this building right in front of me, you know. And pictures do not do justice to just how insane these buildings truly are until you get up close and actually touch the stone yourself and just see the levels of detail that went into every single brick. And you realize, like, we, we just do not do this. We do not do this to our buildings today. And we, we just wouldn't. We just wouldn't bother. And we think we've progressed it's kind of, and they're trying to tell us that the people who built these things were in barren, poor, um, you know, fighting kingdoms who were constantly at war with each other with horse and carriages at best, with pulley systems involving, you know, rope and perhaps some, some wooden type of, um, I don't know, arch system or something like that to lift incredibly heavy stones and bricks. And it's kind of, come on. Give us some credit. Like the history doesn't align or match up with what we've been told where these buildings come from. There's, there's no, there's no chance they were built by the people they claim built these things. No way. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then also, you know, people talk about Tesla and free energy, where free energy came from. Hmm. And I'm really starting to believe um, now. There's, I know you know this thinking that there was a the the delude the diluvian age other words the between genesis chapter one verse one and two uh that there were massive giants and titans everything was huge this is even before the sun and the moon was actually created and i actually believe that giantism some people actually say that the mountains are actually massive giants and you know you see like a a a massive island off the coast of iceland that looks just like a giant elephant. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely unbelievable. But, but anyways, all that stuff's all over the world. I forgot who does that. Some maybe mud flood university. Mud, mud fossils, uh, mud fossils university. Yeah. He, he did. Yeah. He recently did one. Like it's only a few days old that I watched. Absolutely fascinating. Absolutely. He's yeah. been a guest on a couple of our shows, by the way, back to you guys. Yeah. But uh, so and, and we see a different type of uh, megalithic type structure, but those those type of, of buildings, they're they're brutish, they're 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 crude, they are huge, but it's not it's, it's not the same thing uh, as the uh, thousand year reign of Christ, that building program, no. completely different buildings. But I suspect the reason why there was giantism and this goes on to free energy, is that there was no sun and moon. We know some people believe that the throne of God is actually like 10 dimensions up, you know, starting at the pole star and you got to go up. And that's where the throne of God is, where you can look from to and fro throughout the whole earth, you know, scanning. Um, and that actual glory of God rained down and was the light. And that's the reason why we had these 60 foot mile trees and giants and giant this and giant that is that just the energy from his throne even 10 dimensions up still shown upon the earth and it created it likewise i'm starting to suspect that when jesus was here i believe his glory from new jerusalem and i do believe it was probably a fro- floating city maybe over jerusalem uh maybe over the north pole but just like the northern lights that we see, which, um, you know, you had one guest on that talked about, those are the colors that Enoch describes off that, that come from the, the, the throne room of God, this greenish, purplish, well, northern lights, so everybody can remember it. I'm thinking, Paul, is that that glory from Christ ruling, actually, they had northern lights, like maybe every night no- at, at night. Mm-hmm. Maybe those kind of colors were, and somehow they were able to harness that energy through Antiquitech, which we see on a lot of these structures, really strange shapes and sizes, onion dome type things. What do you think about when Christ actually ruling that he himself, through his glory, brought so much energy that there was actually free energy they could just pull from the air, like northern lights throughout the whole realm go ahead no that's fantastic i mean he is the one whose face shines like the sun you know he is he is the light of the world he when he was here i do i do believe 
his presence was enough to to sustain life in all forms far more than the corrupt world itself could i, I agree with you um and I, I do think that's why there was no excuse to not make the pilgrimage during his millennial reign everybody could see where he was simply just follow the light you know go straight there and uh, i do think a lot of these pathways and, and canal ways which you discussed you know in these um they were all pointing towards or led towards him at some point you know what i mean and i think that was the idea it was it was easy to get to him easy to find him and yeah i do believe you know there's evidence yeah here's a new one paul go ahead sorry yeah no no here here's a new one i looked up the continental uh, shelf and the way the, the the titanic plates go together and i looked up over the north pole and there's actually four raised uh, right underneath the ice before the ice came, which I think the little ice age actually caused the earth to be frozen in the Arctic and, and in the Antarctic. But you can actually see where there's, they're about 40 to 80 miles wide. The ridges come up and it looks like pathways. Mm -hmm. you, uh, one or two from like Russia, Asia, another one from like Canada, and then another one from like Norway or the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking that th there was actually, uh, and they say they're anywhere from 40 to 60 miles, something like that. They're, the ridges go up and then it's like, a, like almost like a road. So I, I wanted to give you uh, uh, that information as well. You can look that up. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll look into ahead. that. Yeah, I'll look into it. Absolutely. Yeah, like I said, th this is one of those theories where once you actually start to look into it, more and more evidence starts to pile up pretty quickly that indicates, yes, something like this went on. And there's even an image on my screen right now, which my viewers will be able to see on, on my stream, which is showing that these buildings, as we discussed earlier, were clearly harnessing some kind of etheric energy straight from the atmosphere, something we can't actually do today, and we don't have the same energies available to us. So this means during the specific time, which would have been let's say the millennial kingdom the atmosphere was charged in a way which we just cannot comprehend or understand i do believe a lot of these buildings were were functional as well as beautiful uh, it was it was the marriage of the two things today things are just functional and ugly you know they're the practical and ugly but then it was it was they found a way it seems to use the geometry and the beauty of geometrical principles and forms to harness a specific power um, and it seems like these antennas, which we you know we call spires on cathedrals, let's say, that's what they are really. They're, they're antennas to pick up energy and signals and frequencies and sound. And it seems like a lot of and water was heavily involved with these as well, you know. And and it seems like the healing waters were something that were available to everyone during this time. I think people had extended lifespans during the millennial reign by simply Jesus being present and giving these and these life giving bread and water, these energies to the people, you know, he was, he, he, he sustained everybody with his existence and presence on earth. Absolutely. Which is, that's what you'd expect with, you know, with the son of God, you know, and, um, absolutely. It, people would have been giants they would have grown they would have lived longer they would have been lived long enough to learn more things therefore become more talented and skillful and practical um i'm not saying people lived forever during the, that particular millennial kingdom i think the perfected resurrected saints certainly did and they would have been seeing things in nine dimensions absolutely you know they wouldn't have been seeing things as you humans see them in the perfected glorified immortal bodies but the people who weren't resurrected who lived through tribulation and therefore subsequently lived through the millennial reign with jesus and their descendants living through as well uh, they would have had ext extended life they would have benefited from Christ. Presence. Yeah, the, the scripture yeah. says. Yeah, the scripture says that. In, that if a man doesn't in that day, if a man doesn't live to be a hundred years old, he would be considered cursed. It yeah. says it right there in the scripture. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Paul. So let, let's talk about. Let's talk about. So Christ, he shows up, um, and how he would actually rule. And so this is what I envision, uh, because I come from a geopolitical standpoint. Mm -hmm. I think he would have taken his saints. And they said, look, we have to announce to the whole world that the King of Kings is here, we need to go out to all these different kingdoms and factions. And they weren't like nations like what we think of now. I mean, like Germany, that was a confederation of 600 princes. I mean, it was like every little geographical area 
thing to have like a, a strong man ruling over it. So he would have sent out his delegations. You know, he would have went to the emperor of China, which by the way, they're finding out that the Chinese writings aren't more than 1400 years old. So this whole thing about the Chinese had a billion people over there for a 5,000 year old culture. Nah, I mean, not too fast. I don't know if I believe that, but so Christ would send out delegations and he would send out like, uh, let's say uh, Thomas, you take a delegation and go see the emperor of China. The delegation would show up and we wouldn't just say, we want to let you know that the king of kings is here. He is now ruling. And I can see what the Chinese emperor would say. King of kings? Well, I thought I was the king of kings. Now, exactly how big an army does this king of kings have? Mm. And, you know, you could see where Jesus would say, well, Thomas, just ask them for their greatest dragon that they keep. They're keepers of dragons. Mm. Get their most fear dragon and then just rip his head off and then we don't have to do the man dance with all the battles and all the rest of that stuff so and of course he also could have had directed energy but he would have quickly i think very quickly subdued the the, the kings and the princes of the earth probably sent them like a 700 page contract look we're not going to get rid of you but you're not going to have homosexuality you know the the money's got to be real it's got to be gold you know no more of this you, my 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 um, missionaries that come through, you can't kill them. So here's the rules of the game. As long as you stick to the 700 page contract, which are basically the laws of God, you know, you don't be stealing people's stuff and all the rest, then we're good with you and we'll see how things work out. So I actually think that Christ would have subdued the earth fairly quickly. And I actually think that he would have gone to like the redheaded giants of North America, that the Native American Indians. And I think he would have said, look, stop stealing women. Don't breed with them. And I won't send a party out here to hunt your, basically hunt your butt down and exterminate you. Maybe the, the giants of um, Paraguay, he, he said that to him too. And could have been elves, dwarves. There's there supposed to be an island of dogmen. Uh, like St. Christopher was supposed to be. I think he might have went to them and said, look, we're not going to exterminate you, but you're going to stick to the island. You're not going to interbreed. And so what, what, what do you think about when he started his rule? Don't you think he would have quickly been able to let the world recognize, wait a minute, th this is the structure. You know, this is the, this is sort of the geopolitical structure I'm overlaying on all of these different kings with like maybe like St. Paul ahead of, you know, the Asian Bureau, where you get disputes among different princes or whatever, then they come to St. Paul and he's kind of, you know, he has a council that rules over that. What, what, do, what do you say about that? I'm big, it's because I'm geopolitical. That, that's the way I think. So what, what do you think of that? Yeah, I, th I think um, Jesus would have been relatively diplomatic about the whole thing. Absolutely. I, don't, I mean, he's, 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 he's just and fair at the end of the day. He's not a tyrant. That's not the point of his rule. You know, I think it, it's, um, I think it would have gone down a lot like you just described there. And I think, um, I don't think I, there's much more I could really add that would, that would, uh, flesh it out any more than what you've just described now don't forget as well though there would have been tribulation just before this so there would have been earthquakes wars famines utter destruction plagues it would have been a, a pretty nightmarish time um especially for those who warred against god you know and and the punishment for those who who murdered him and the rest and it would have been you know it would have been a tumultuous time just before his return so it, he would have come in and appeared and, and obviously come down to the remnants of that tribulation, probably offering an olive branch, a, a peace, you know what I mean? And just saying, look, we can rebuild, we can make this better, it doesn't have to be this way type of thing. And like I said, there would have been pushback, there would have been those who refused to give up their power, like you said. And, you know, I think he would have done that in the most quick and efficient, succinct way possible as you described in quite a diplomatic way just send a perfected superhuman resurrected saint there who can clearly just manipulate reality by probably with his own thoughts by that point because he sees beyond the physical in, in ways we just can't comprehend you know and he probably would have put an end to like i said the biggest baddest beast they had very quickly and and that display of power is pretty much how these tyrants usually get that's what they respect power you know and 
there would have been no greater power on, on the earth during that time than, than Christ and what he was capable of. But I do believe, you know, it, it would have also been a case of people could clearly see his kingdom as well. It would have been clearly there above everybody for all eyes to see as as a real thing that they could not really deny. And I think if anyone did put up an, an initial or kickback or pushback and then begrudgingly signed that contract, as you said, and got got on board, I think that even then they would have very quickly realized it was in their benefit to do that. And they're actually benefiting greatly now from from, you know, believe in christ and, and following his ways and, and yeah that's a know. good point uh, that's a good point paul before we get to, to the second we're going to get into the little season this yeah. is revolution radio at freedomslips.com you're listening to uh my 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 brain's all uh, on this tartare uh <laughs> millennial stuff uh you're listening to the most important things the true reality of this earth i'm the hijacker with paul of understanding conspiracy uh you can find his work over on YouTube, uh, he's got he's done many many shows. He's all about conspiracies. Neither him or I, I think he probably holds out a little bit more that he's not putting two feet in this whole new theory uh, or whole new theology. Well, that's what it's really turning into. Because we're going to get into the uh, in the second hour. We're going to get into uh, uh, the little season of Satan and exactly what that means. Uh, but um, uh, to pick it back up from where we left off, uh, you're right, uh, Paul, about uh, the, the world would have been when Christ came. I actually believe that part of this great deception of Satan, it, the, the, this, I think this is the great deception. And I think it even has the power, like the Bible says, if possible, to deceive even the elect. Because I know many, many Christians, they just say you're a heretic. But just for the for the record, I'm like 99% there. I hold out 1% saying I don't know, and I think you're in, you're in the same camp, maybe a higher percentage, because we don't want to trip up anybody's faith. We don't want. We could be wrong. There could be a mark of the beast, the seven year tribulation. So, uh, real quick, Paul, where do you come down on that? You're not. You're not 100 percent either, are you? You hold back a little bit. Well, look, you, when it comes to ideas like this, these all encompassing tautologies, you, you do have to step back a little bit and, and wonder, you know, you, you do, because uh, I, I come it from a conspiratorial angle. So I've I've seen many topics come and go and I've seen controlled opposition involved with each one. And I've seen uh, I've seen factions get created and I've seen I've seen that there are agendas at play to deceive. So I ha you have to be weary of every topic that comes your way. But as I wasn't raised in a church, I didn't have a particular dogma necessarily that I, I was wedded to from birth or from a, as a child that um, I didn't have pastors preaching anything to me, such as the dispensationalism or the preacher rapture and all these type of things and how we're waiting for the second coming of Christ. Now, don't get me wrong, when I first became a Christian in 2014, that's all I ever really heard, you know, that Christ is about to return and we're about to go through tribulation. So I was there for a long time, but I always felt like there's something snake oily about this, about this message. OK, and I'm looking, this is not me trying to put down people's faith here you know and i'm not saying i'm right or i'm a preacher or you should listen to me necessarily you know but what i'm saying is as somebody who came at it from relatively fresh outsider perspective eyes and has been studying the word without any preconceived notions there are certain things i can't really ignore easily such as um in matthew 16 28 where he says verily i say unto you there'll be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the son of man coming in his kingdom or let's say in um, uh, Mark 9, 1, and he said unto them, there are some that stand here which will not taste death. So it's, it's repeating the same me message. People right in front of him are, are going to see him come back in their lifetime. Uh, Matthew ten twenty three. But when they persecute you, flee in this city, flee to another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over all the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Now that's not a very large place. And that's not very many cities to get through. That's pretty immediate, you know. Uh, in um, his language was immediate from start to finish. You know, he, he's talking to a uh, Cephas as well, and he's he's talking to this guy, and he's he's telling him, you know, uh, you, you will you will see me come. You know, I am the son of God, and he's saying, you know, uh, for example, um, you would see me coming in the clouds of heaven. You will see me physically return. 
you know, and that isn't, people like to say he was talking about his resurrection. And that's not what he's saying. Jesus is saying, you will see me come in the clouds of heaven. You will see me come back down to earth. I will come back. <laughs> you know, he's making it very clear. It says, um, you know, Matthew 23, very I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Now, that's in present tense of this generation. He's not talking about a future generation 2,000 years from now. He's telling people right in front of him, you know, this generation will not pass till you see these things fulfilled, till you see me coming in my kingdom in the clouds. Revelation, which is the revelation to John, you know, in Patmos, by Jesus Christ, is his word himself. The very first thing he says in Revelation is, these things which must shortly come to pass. And that's the whole book of Revelation is shortly coming to pass. Now, how how can you, you know, again, Revelations 1.3, the time is at hand. Revelations 1.7, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him. Now, that's pretty <clears throat> damn immediate because those people are getting on a bit now. They're getting old by this point, right? So, you know, <laughs> the time is short for those people who pierced him. Then he's telling they will see me. I'm about to return. And he's, he's saying with, with urgency to John, seal not the sayings of this prophecy in this book, for the time is at hand. Go and tell everybody I am about to return. It's, it's about to happen. It must shortly be done. Surely I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Repeated over and over and over again in Revelation. So when I see these things, and I sincerely ask listeners to, to just read the words of your Savior, our Savior, my Savior, Jesus Christ, he told those people clearly in that time, for that specific period, with no uncertainty or metaphorical like um, hiding behind his words or mincing of words, he was very strongly saying, it's about to happen now, not 2,000 years yeah, in the future. And we, and we actually believe the book of Revelation. If there was a 200 million man um, kings of the East army, I believe it. In other words, the, the, this age of deception, of deceit uh, from Satan, is to basically not only hide that thousand-year millennial, but to hide Jesus Christ at all, overall. But the world was, you're right, it wasn't a catastrophe. And so let's talk about when he comes back, he's going to see the world, all the devastation, all the stuff that we read about mm -hmm. in the book of Revelation. Probably every eye did see him. I don't, you know, some of these praetorists, they go, no, no, it was just the people of Jerusalem or it was just the Jews, that type of thing. No, no, it was more than that. It was more than just Jerusalem. I think whatever was written uh, happened, but it's been covered up in history. And I think that's part of the great deception. Mm -hmm. But let's actually think about Christ in his thousand year kingdom. He would have quickly got control. Peace would have came on the earth. He would have started the building project. But then how would people have lived? We'll stop it to think about that. So you mentioned this book that you read called The Smoky God by, uh, I, I can't think of the name. Names are, mm -hmm. um, they went to, supposedly they went to the center of the earth or they went into the Arctic. Um, and basically what they were all about um, and it's very interesting. They did say they were like 12 to 15 foot giants, beautiful people. Um, but when I, when I read some of that, I thought that is how Christ would set up this kingdom. It would be hard work. Uh, first off, the money would be gold and silver. So all of these coins that you see are marked with the all seeing eye that say 1742 or 639. And you see a Roman queen or whatever. I think that was all a deception later on. Uh, as a way of saying, oh, no, no, we're just now starting to date the, when Christ had come back. Uh, but what would be the lifestyle? People would work hard, buildings, architecture. It would be art, horticulture, agriculture. It wouldn't be like massive stinking factories with combustion engines and nuclear power plants. And, you know, uh, it probably would have been canal type driven, maybe even airships. It would have been low footprint on the earth. I mean, think about it. if people think that Christ is going to come back now, he's got a thousand years just to clean up the oceans and all the pollution on the earth. I mean, that's, that's a thousand year job right now. The, the earth is so polluted and gunked up. But I think it was more of an 
uh, agrarian, uh, very wholesome. On the seventh day, we, they got together in great worship halls to listen to uh, incredible speakers and to worship. That organ, like you said, could have had healing energies. Mm -hmm. A lot of the buildings, they were communal. Uh, now that we see some of these, uh, when we go around the earth and find a lot of these older buildings, and it's like, you know, like one of the ones they ripped down during the uh, uh, the the international uh, exposés where they had all these buildings. Uh, the they World's said Fest, they put the together. World's yeah, the World's Fest, Fest right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of them say, "Oh, they built this. They built this hotel, 520 rooms." And by the way, they did it in a year. I mean, ridiculous, ridiculous. You, you should see that building, Paul. So um, don't you think oh, that the concept that I'm giving that it would be wholesome, good food, gardens, art, um, uh, hard work, that would be part of it. Uh, probably the money was gold and silver, uh, maybe even had scriptures on it. John 316 for, you know, a gold coin. Who knows? I don't think it's going to be a lot of uh, these uh, goddess images or whatever we see with later coins, which are not gold and silver. So he would have restored the economic system, mm -hmm. um, which is, might might be the reason why we can't get the gold and silver now is because that's the first thing once Satan was released, get the money, get inside the church, get the books. I mean, he would have a, a full scale agenda. So what do you envision the, the thousand year like would it be what i'm what i'm talking about what you know sort of like the smoky god where they were all into music and and, and agriculture horticulture I, th I think so I, I think i think i mean don't forget you know our god is a, is a is a beautiful amazing talented artist at the end of the day he's a creator you know he creates things and we're made in his image okay and he strives for beauty in all things and perfection and that's what we should strive for. And likely, given the chance and the resources and the knowledge and the time, we also would strive for that perfection too. And if you look at just any old photos of what these places looked like, like Dresden, for example, before it got utterly decimated in World War One and World War Two by bombings, you know, and raids, these places were paradises on Earth. They were pure odes to perfection. You know, people made by people who truly cared about where they were and loved the place and the land and that was their home you know and they made the most of it and i think everybody would have done that um under the under the time of jesus christ and you know in the year of the lord which is what a lot of these coins like you said in gold seem to have the they have like i 637 or j 543 in the year of the lord jesus christ 653 of its thousand year reign you know things like that seem to be there's remnants of that everywhere, all over these buildings, in written in stone, and they've clearly edited and changed a lot of things since the little season began, and added numbers in front of things where numbers prior weren't there, like ones and X's to add a thousand years to the timeline, you know, that don't exist. Um, but the, these buildings that were built, again, they, like I said, they were communal in some way. These are mansions with many rooms, and we're told his father has many mansions, you know, <laughs> waiting for these people in his kingdom. Um, and that's that's I think that promise was fulfilled on Earth. And I do. I, it's funny, you know, cause, uh, just a, a little anecdote. But I, I have always been a heavy dreamer. OK, I have very vivid, powerful dreams. And I always have. And I used to dream a lot um, that I was exploring grand, complex, cobbled stone cities with multiple rooms and facets that I would then hop from room to room and just see multiple thousands of people inhabiting these places in like what seems like an ultra complex hotel dorm room type system of some place. And I, I've dreamed these dreams since I was a teenager, you know, before I was into any of these things. These are the realms I would explore as a child in my mind in these dreams or as, as a teenager or as, even as an adult and I never understood them I always would leave these dreams dumbfounded and awe inspired by the, the places I had just been and seen you know I've dreamt of seeing onion dome topped cathedrals coming out of pits in the ground in gloriful lights and shining and I never understood what any of these dreams were and I'm starting to think now I've done this research into the millennial reign and I'm seeing these old buildings everywhere and what these cities used to look like that maybe in some way perhaps I was seeing in these dreams what perhaps it once was, you know, and and I I I feel like I have seen what it would have been like in these dreams and I I cannot describe to you 
the perfection in it all, the safety in it all, the wonder in it all, the community within it all, how the people would have all been living this this perfect world and reality with one another. And there may have been places where there was rebellion, and I don't think they would have had a great time, you know, with the droughts and everything else in between for not going along with the program. But for those who did, yes, they would have made artwork, they would have built sculptures, they would have they would have made beautiful music, classical music, for example, which is no words, which is perfect music for the organs that were playing, which were healing people and teaching people and helping them see that there is beauty in things and there's and the more you strive for beauty and what you create, the more beautiful the world you can have it can can become, you know. And I, I think these these foundational principles of of beauty and standards was certainly the most prevalent thing in the minds of those who lived for for, for hundreds of years with the time and the resources. Oh, that's, well, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, that, that's wonderful. It, uh, your, your young men shall dream dreams and see visions. And so, yeah, absolutely. Before we get to the, 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 the rise of Satan, which is the period that we believe that we're in, right about Revelation 20, uh, right after Christ's thousand year rule, one little thing about him and his governance and ruling, I, something I found out, and I wanted to get this to you, just so uh, you would under uh, get this in, uh, information, because I would encourage you, Paul, after you're done with this book on, you know, the Nephilim look like clowns, I would seriously think about taking all the information that you got and doing a book on, you know, the millennial kingdom of Christ. So, but anyways, <laughs> so uh, you can see, see Thomas comes to, you know, he's over the region of uh, Siberia, Russia, and he comes to Jesus and he goes, Jesus, you know, I, 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 got, I got this problem. I got the Mongols on the one side and I got the Chinese and they're all like stealing each other's stuff. They're, they're like ripping off each other's wives. And Jesus will say, well, who's over? Who's the leadership? And I can see Thomas saying, well, you know, you don't get it. They don't even have a government. It's these people are just like, it's they, they run around in hurts, in little huts, and they're no man. And it's just, they're unruly. What do I do? And so the, I found out that the Great Wall of China, uh, this guy, Anton Antonio Fumelchio, uh, he wrote the book, History, colon, Fiction or Science. And he just basically says all the stuff that you got. And this guy's a mathematician. He's a big brain guy wrote yeah, this he's, big he's, book Antolo, he says all the time Antolo Fomenko, Antolo Fomenko the Russian mathematician yes that's it yeah yeah that's it but it turns out he's you know about the about the great wall of China that's you know eight it took eight 1866 years to build you know from 243 246 BC to 1620 he said that's just BS that's just just it's all ridiculous he said in fact the Jesuits he, he now said as the Jesuits in the uh, uh, 15th, 16th, or the 16th and 17th century, they rewrote all of history. It goes all the way back uh, to right before Christ. But the Great Wall, it turns out the, the original name of the wall, the Great Wall of China, was uh, the Wall of Gog and Magog. And mm. I'm personally thinking that Jesus told Thomas, look, I'll tell you what, we start a jobs program. We pay them where they can build this wall, both of them together. They can build this wall to be good for communists. And that way we can we can actually hire them. They got something to do besides stealing each other's stuff. Uh, and there's a jobs program. We'll get them because it does look like the wall was built by men creatures. It is not it's not that fancy. It's not like one of these buildings. It does look like, you know, men actually did it. Mm -hmm. And so uh and then, then we'll separate them. We'll separate the Mongols because most people don't know that the wall is actually, um, it's not north-south. The wall is actually um, uh, east-west. And it was actually the original border of China versus Russia up there. Mm. But uh, so anyways, his governance would have been something like that. But I, I know we only got about uh, 30, 40 minutes left, Paul, and I wanted to get to this because this is really important. Yeah. This is after, did you want to comment on that about the Great Wall? Uh, interesting that it's Gog and Magog. That, that is fascinating because it does say, you know, after Revelation, after the millennial reign has ended and when the, the, the little season begins, it is said that um, Satan will gather an army from the, core, the four corners of the earth. He would gather Gog and Magog 
and march along the broad expanse of the earth to make war with the camp of saints and the largest expanse we have on on the earth is the expanse from the tip of uh, spain all the way up to the tip of russia um of siberia and uh, i do believe that is the expanse towards the north pole where people will march north to make war in the end in the little season well so. just just I'll just just on geopolitical talk a lot of people think oh it's all about well i can't say that because i know you're on youtube but it's all about the middle east with that group of people this mm -hmm. is the whole thing driving it well guess what the russians are saying the russians are saying the orthodox russian church is fighting against the west it's an anti-christ system it is a b system and this is the real reason for the war which probably has to do with two groups arguing about who's going to control the digital money or whatever mm -hmm. but be that as it may think about it paul the last remaining place around the north pole that is not completely enclosed with the b system the netherlands are britain is canada united states is russia mm -hmm. and that would co complete the total uh, encompassment of uh, the north pole once uh, russia and the russian orthodox christian falls and right and now they're talking about they're going to have war. They're going to, they're going to do mm -hmm. one thing after another, uh, drafting and everything else in all these NATO countries. But yeah. I, I want to get to this because this is important. Um, this is kind of like another mini revelation. So we got the thousand years. Christ knows that that soon the the the, the floating city over Jerusalem, or maybe he's going to cloak it at the North Pole, um, or it will descend down or whatever, but he knows that Satan is going to be released from the pit. Now, I stop and I think about what would that be like uh, a, a thousand years in which people have not lived with Satan and his the, the fallen ones hmm. going out, which by the way, that place in Siberia that looks like it's got potholes, it's been hit with, you know, a thousand uh, asteroids. You know what I'm talking about on Google Earth. Yeah, I just I just showed that, that recently been where, myself. Yeah, yeah, I got a theory that those were those were where the fallen ones were actually bound, and they actually blew a hole coming up, and that's why you look those those are the those are the pits in which uh, they were bound. I think I stole that from one of your guys. I steal a lot of stuff from from you guys, <laughs> um, but uh, I can't remember who. You you might know us something. I can't remember. Uh, but this is my this is my point is that after a thousand years of no sin living in a peaceful beautiful kingdom uh with beautiful people uh wondrous thousand year reign sin and evil would almost been like a virus there's a there's a movie it's called the the invention of lies have you ever seen it I was oh. just thinking about that before you said it. Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that. The invention right. of lying, yes. Nobody, nobody ever lied to one another. So mm -hmm. you can imagine once Satan was released, it would almost be like a virus in which the evil people among them, uh, which I do believe, uh, like the Khazarians and the different serpent seed line, I think Christ left them alone as long as they stuck to the contract. But I also think that's where they went underground and they built all these underground cities and tunnels and everything else. I think as Christ was building the thousand year kingdom on the surface world, the dark ones that, that did not have allegiance, uh, but they knew Jesus was the king of kings. There was nothing they could do about it. Uh, they, they weren't allowed to be snatching any more children or whatever. But I do think that they might have built a subterranean infrastructure at the same time, which would account for that. But my point is, is that once Satan was released, Paul, that when they would start to be tempted, oh, you can have your neighbor's wife. Look how beautiful she is. Mm. I mean, I mean, she's got a rack on her. Think about that. I think these people were so innocent. I think they thought you know, having relations with a, uh, a neighbor's wife. Can you do that? Is that allowed? Is that why would you say that? Or why? Why do you think I can just take something from somebody else? In other words, the people would have been so innocent, Paul, that this the, 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 the wickedness that would have came upon him almost would have been like a contagious virus. Uh, speak on that as a, like a little mini revelation, so to speak, about the innocence of the people. 
go ahead. No, that's a great point. Yeah, again, if you, if you had lived without Satan whispering in your ear um, for a thousand years as a, as, a, as a collective group of people, I'm sure that would definitely have... It'll make you naive more than anything coming out of it. And I think we can attest to that by this idea that many people were kind of locked up into insane asylums around the 17, 1800s, according to our history. And the buildings that were created as insane asylums supposedly are so ornate and large and intricate and it can house thousands of people and you have to wonder who the hell is building insane asylums so large and so intricate to house crazy people like that doesn't make any sense what kind of epidemic of insane people must you be having to build buildings like this and it's likely like i said um a lot of naivety came through and and a lot of people didn't realize that when satan was released by simply preaching and continuing to go on about jesus would would have detrimental consequences for you you know and you needed to be shut up and put away i think that did happen to a lot of people sadly because of their own naivety and not understanding what true evil actually is after not truly experiencing what that what it means to to encounter evil and i think we even suffer from that today um i think naivety is one of the main issues people have today when it comes to confronting evil because it's natural for us when we're when evil people do things it's kind of well i wouldn't do something like that so why would they and that's how a lot of people get deceived because they, they assume good intentions that they have on other people and that's 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 where you lose basically immediately because uh i think these people who lived immediately after the millennial kingdom who remained behind um because i don't know if there was a choice perhaps to go with jesus when he left it to the beloved city maybe many people didn't want to leave their homes maybe it's like no i'm going to stay because uh, this is my home this is where i belong i don't know necessarily well maybe people that were mortal maybe people that actually were mortal flesh and blood yeah. at the time and could procreate the works they weren't allowed it was that. One of these yeah, rules. Yeah. it's probably but, that more than, more than likely speaking, yeah but go ahead sorry yeah but speaking of Speaking of the timeline, so this is the way I've got it, Paul, and I wanted to run it by you. I do believe Christ came in 70 AD. The thousand-year kingdom was set up, which would take us to uh, uh, 1070 Mm -hmm. before uh, Satan was released. Um, And so we're actually taking a look at a timeline. I'm actually starting to think that the Catholic Church was actual the residual, the pageantry, uh, the grandness, uh, even some of the structure was because the, the Christ does say you will, you will reign like priests and kings in my kingdom. Mm-hmm. So that I do believe the glorified saints, they were like bishops. They went around the earth. Uh, that so, but anyways, that whole type of Catholic residual religious celestial type of structure was set up. I think at first, I think when when Satan was released, I do believe that there was, that was the first big mud flood. Mm. I think the ground shook and I think, I think chaos broke out when the, when the fallen ones and when Satan was released. So what do you say on that particular level? Once Christ thousand years was well over and Satan was released, do you believe that that's, that might be part of what we see with the mud flood? Go ahead. Yeah, well, I, th- I think if you've been locked away for a thousand years, you're going to make a bit of a fuss when you get released. To the, you, you need to stretch your wings a little bit, you know what I mean? And I think when he was released, he he brought with him chaos and destruction as much as he possibly could. Um, I think the earth would have shook. I think it would have been um would have been destruction certainly, and earthquakes we know can cause um liquefaction of 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 solid ground basically making it into quicksand so we do see evidences that many buildings do seem to be maybe six to six foot under the ground in some extreme cases maybe up to 10 meters or some in some very extreme cases maybe even buried but those mud floods are seem to be isolated to certain areas it doesn't seem like everywhere was affected necessarily by that perhaps those closest to the epicenter of his release from the pit were more affected by the mud flood and maybe that's something we can actually look into as researchers maybe we can actually if we can maybe map out where the most mud flooded places are on a on a on a map, we might be able to pinpoint by that through triangulation exactly where the pit was and where he was released. Maybe just a theory that came to me just now. Actually, a thought. Maybe someone should do that or start doing that. Um, yeah, and then the other thing is, let's talk about uh, during the flood that not only the fountains of the deep were broke open, but the windows of heaven. Yeah. And so I'm actually starting to think that during this release this this season this little season which i have a theory on how 
uh, Satan has been being able to uh, make it go longer. Uh, and that was that whole abortion angle that you had. Yeah. In other words, not give people a chance. But the point is, is that the windows open. So there, it could have been that once Satan was released, he would naturally gather up the people that were of the serpent seed line, mm -hmm. uh, that were the dark ones. Uh, he would have infiltrated the church. He would have went for the books. He would have went for the money. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then he would have slowly, he couldn't corrupt the church all at once. So I found out that, it, that during the Renaissance, which means rebirth, that there was whole groups set up to create nothing but these beautiful type of statues, mm -hmm. religious statues, marble statues, and all the rest of this stuff. And I think that he started taking these graven images at first. They, they put them in the churches. Well, that's Mother Mary. Uh, and this is Saint such and such. And slowly he started corrupting it. Uh, and I think it went on for a couple hundred years uh, where there was no real timeline. In other words, I'm on the belief that it goes to 1070, a couple hundred years, nothing gets recorded. And, and then he's corrupt in the church. But then he thinks, well, I got to make him believe that since Christ came, and then he starts this thing with the money, starts dating the money, the copper coins. And I've got some uh, things here in which the first actual coin uh, was like 12, um, 1204, 1234, and was from Denmark. And the first coin was actually gold. Uh, they had, did have silver ones. It was a dinar or damar or something. Uh, and, and it had a, a miter hat, like a Pope's hat on one side and a crown on the other. They still weren't dealing with gay, uh, graven images. And so then they used the money and started dating the money and then started changing the timeline. The same with the books. You can see on all the books as well as the coins, the I, the J, the X, all for Christ. And this was also part of a... Uh, a satanic plot to make people think, oh, you know, this is instead of it being 234, uh, it's actually 1234, but it's an I or a J. And so slowly they corrupt it. So what's your thinking on uh, <laughs> the timeline? <clears throat> How you think, um, you know, we, we got the maps, mm -hmm. we've got the books, we got the coins. We got the buildings. We got so many pieces of the puzzle. Um, you know, when he was released from the pit, how do you think that he went about gathering up his forces? And how do you think he brought us down? Take taking us to this point. Go ahead. <laughs> How did he bring us down? Well, you have to wonder whether we should take a full revisionist history approach to this and just throw everything out the window. And you know, do we take into account the early church fathers, for example, and their initial writings um, and the establishment of the apostolic uh, secession version of uh, Catholicism? Do we talk about the Nicene Creed in the 320, I think it was? Um, do we talk about the collapse of Rome in 500, uh, in the 500s, you know, on the worst day on record in 541? Uh, do we count? Do we count them as the dates we were given or were they perhaps a lot closer to 70 AD than we were told, you know, and they've just con they've added years to our history. Um, just how many people were involved in revising history and creating these false narratives and from, and from when exactly? Did Satan know he was about to be bound up for a thousand years? So did he perhaps get his his minions in human form, his historians, he didn't say it, and he would have planned ahead, I think, for the millennial reign. Therefore, we really, it really is a question of whether we can take any history, historical record from the, the mainstream narrative at, at, at its word. We really have to wonder. Um, but it does seem, I, I am, I'm inclined to believe that a lot of what we were told happened up into maybe the 500s AD before the Dark Ages began is fabricated or elongated, shall we say, in many ways. Um, I think it did happen perhaps in what we would call 70 AD. And then obviously a thousand year reign from there would leave us to 1070 AD, it seems. And then upon his release, it would go down a lot like we described earlier with um, the shutting up of 
Christians and people who still follow Christ, the naive ones, by locking them away in insane asylums and accusing them of being religious, fervid freaks, you know, or something like that. Obviously, we have people like um, Sigmund Freud in those early years locking people up in insane asylums for religious fervor. That was one of the reasons behind why that happened, you know. Um, the I, I do think a lot of people who lived through the millennial reign who did not agree with Christ were just waiting for him to leave and waiting for Satan to turn back up so they could help re-establish a new kingdom. I think the Freemasons had a lot to do with that and secret societies. I think they are a continuation of the mystery wisdom schools prior to his reign and uh, around the flood period and onwards. And I think they picked up where Satan left off immediately after Christ ended his millennial reign and Satan had his little season. And I think they were just waiting for him to turn up. And when Satan was released, he went straight to his foot soldiers in these secret societies and they established a new world order. And that's where you have things like um, the Freemasons claiming a lot of these things for themselves and claiming they built them. I think there's a, a tongue in cheek joke in the name Freemasonry. They just basically took all the free real estate they could that was laying around after Christ's reign. And again, these people are the winners. They write the history. They locked up those who didn't conform to the new world order, you know, and, and I think a lot of the children of these parents who were locked up were raised in their schools with their indoctrination. And it only took about two or three generations to completely make the new generations believe they're living in 1850 rather than 1000 and... 250 let's say you know what i couldn't give you a specific timeline but it's certainly not right. 18 so it, you know what we were calling all these buildings were being built according to our history in the 1800s was more than likely one the 1200s by true definition you know and again they right. do this by adding uh changing the ones uh, sorry, the eyes in front of numbers into and claiming they represent ones and then inventing a new currency to fill in that void and that gap as well. Um, to where you start printing new coins which are similar to the old ones but you do make it clear it's a one rather than an I or a J to muddy the waters. And, you know, most people... Most humans don't take the time to study things that closely and they're banking on human lazy laziness to not bother to actually look into these things you know and i think it worked for a long time and they've created what we live in today a, a full controlled prison system for the mind where they control the flow of information 100 percent. and this is truly if satan was to establish a kingdom in a little season this is it i could not think of anything better than what we have today I really couldn't. And it's subtle because what he's also done, he's, he's created a world where it seems like Christianity is the strongest, growing, most powerful religion. And perhaps that is not his doing. Perhaps that's still Christ doing that it is so powerful and strong. Perhaps he knew he could never get rid of the Bible. He has no chance of destroying the word of God or the Holy Spirit from working in his kingdom. No chance of that at all. But what he did do was confuse us as to where we are in the timeline. Every church and every institution of any 501c3 you know organized uh, tax exempt company who's a part of these coalitions that go right back to the catholic church or a denomination of protestantism whatever it is they all preach the same theology christ is about to return and tribulation is about to happen the millennial kingdom has not happened yet and those who do say it has happened with the amillennialist viewpoint well it's a spiritual thing it was never physical you know he's we're in the millennial reign now from and he's reigning with god uh, in heaven you know and it's always these these ethereal metaphorical versions of something which i believe was quite real and physical and literal and i i take christ as his word when he said he would literally return in the clouds with the kingdom i believe him and like I said, I think that's how they've done it. I think that's how they've covered it up, just th through thorough control of the flow of information. But I do believe he has constantly been battling against Christ, Christ's word, which is written on our hearts and the Holy Spirit as well. So right. he couldn't fully destroy the truth. But what he did was just take us off by one degree, the timeline issue. And one degree over, over many, many years turns into a big deviation, you know, and that's all he had to do um yeah yeah well, well paul we got about 20 minutes left and i want to get to this but it, con concerning the timeline just from a geopolitical angle when i take a look and realize wait a minute christ thousand year reign was over or he took new jerusalem the holy city mm -hmm. uh probably to the arctic and then it was left open that created a political power vacuum and you can actually take a look just like what the bible says 
Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Mm -hmm. What happens when he's released? Boom. Genghis Khan says, Tartaria is mine. <laughs> I I'm the one in charge of this. Other person, nothing but wars. The Romans start fighting G Germania. You got, uh, look at the wars that started like right around the 17th century. Mm -hmm. You actually had a nation called the Holy Roman Empire and the Seven Years War. And you had like Napoleon attacking Russia. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was literally a world war. That, you know, they call our war the, the, the Revolutionary War, but it was just an extension. But wars everywhere, power vacuum opened up. And then, then all of a sudden now we're finding out all of the killing that was done. We've got the catacombs. Turns out it's just not in Paris. Skulls, millions of skulls. Were they taking Christians in who were going to were speaking up or whatever and killing them? Turns out there's catacombs in uh, Central America, South America. They even found some in uh, uh, places of Asia. So like a kill fest, not only a kill fest, destroying like King Henry VIII. Mm -hmm. They say he destroyed like. 800 of these big beautiful buildings so what do you think about once christ left that the when satan was released a power vacuum opened up and the whole world all of a sudden descended into mm -hmm. go ahead go ahead a well, lot of most of history like I said especially um post enlightenment is just a feudal system of 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 empires against empire isn't it who tr trying to vie for full control over everything <laughs> and um i mean world war one is a great example of of literally a warring wars of full empires you know and the amount of destruction those wars caused with new technology and weaponry which you have to wonder where we got these abilities to, to cause destruction on such a mass scale came from you know but bombs and planes and all sorts of things were being invented around that time machines of war tanks you know all of these things which are just far beyond cannons and uh, and simple one-shot muskets with gunpowder we're talking machines machinery of death and destruction began to happen in the 20th century and i think the 20th century was really the main period where empire came against empire and 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 the abilities to utterly destroy became to full came to full fruition you know and i think a lot of the past was destroyed during that those raids I do believe so. I think I think during the World War One and World War Two, we lost everything, and what we have now is literally just a husk of of the kingdom that remained. But it's it, this is the thing about the Millennial Kingdom. It was so all encompassing and vast and huge and enormous that it's taken hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, possibly five hundred years, to even get close to trying to re remove what what was once there. And even then, there's still there's still things still remain, you know, and it's it's becoming harder and harder. Um, I think for Satan now to to get rid of these buildings, as as obviously we live in the Matrix lie, it's hard to justify deconstructing or destroying a cathedral now, you know. Um, but the best excuse is all out chaos and war, isn't it? And that's exactly what he did. He 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 stole the free mate. He stole the kingdom. Claimed it his own, so he came to steal. He killed the remnants that were left over, so he came to kill. And he has then begun to systematically destroy everything that he claimed ownership of. Um, and that's exactly the modus operandi of Satan, and that's the world we still live in. And, you know, I, I, I don't know where we are in that timeline of the little season. I don't know how long a little season is. Um, and there's, there's a lot of intricacies and nuances that need to be hashed out first to understand, first of all, who are we? during this little season exactly as people are we remnants or the descendants of the remnants of the millennial reign or are we the rest of the dead that is said to be resurrected um after the millennial kingdom ends you know and if that's that's my neck that's that's right where i'm going paul that's yeah. right where i'm going yeah it, it's so you go ahead but you alluded there earlier, and uh, something I mentioned is we have to start with this with this new perspective, this lens, because this is what it is. It's a lens to view reality through, um, just like the Mandela effect is a lens or flat earth as a topic is a lens. And we should probably treat them as lenses for now until we know more information before we can soli solidly say, yes, this is 100 percent truth. Look at the world through the lens and does it make sense with reality, you know, and and through this lens we have to then wonder okay so so who are we if we if we are the rest of the dead before christ who is being resurrected with a chance to know christ in a world where christ can be known which is this remnant of his kingdom which we live in now you know the little season then that means how long is a little season well how long is a piece of string how long is it going to take for every single soul who once lived before to be resurrected once more with a chance to know christ before final judgment 
And well, the devil would try and slow that process down if that is what's going on. And what better way to do that than to make sure humans don't have a chance. So abortion would be a good way of doing that. Um, death and destruction and the killing of innocent lives would be the best way to do that. The killing of children, the murder and sacrifice of children would be the best way to do that. As long yeah, as you, false religions, everything. Yeah, false cultures, false religions. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. As, as long as you, you know, child sacrifice would be the best way to do that in any shape or form. Because as long as you can get that child before they lose their innocence and they can make the choice. Because again, a, a babe in the eyes of God is innocent. You know what I mean? You, you can't put judgment on a child. That, what do they know? You know. Um, but as soon as they get old enough to understand the knowledge of good and evil, and they can make that choice, they can be judged. You know, it's as simple as that. And if he can prevent as many people being born into this world to from getting to that point then maybe he can slow down uh the end coming you know because i i do think it's a case of god I, i'm starting to lean on the idea that it's going to be no soul left behind jesus is the good shepherd he doesn't leave his sheep behind you know he doesn't he 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 saves them all i think he's planning to save all of humanity in the end i don't think he's i think it's really is good news i think we're all going to get saved okay and i don't think he's going to allow anyone to slip through the cracks um and i think if that takes another thousand years for all the rest of the dead to be born again to make the choice of christ then so be it you know i i, I well you know there's actual go ahead sorry no there's, there's actual scripture what you're talking about and this is going to make me some going to consider me a heretic so i do come with scripture but during this little season which by the way little season uh as far as from god's perspective or man so some people say oh it's only like 250 years or whatever i'm with you paul i'm not so sure about that i'm a little season and also for satan to prolong it where uh, christ actually uh now this gets into um right at the end when it talks about a uh, satan will go up to the plane of the earth he will go out to deceive this, this, the nations take them to war to, to uh, enclose the encampment of the saints and their number was the, as the sands of the sea well right around 1875 we hit maybe a billion people maybe 1900 we had a billion mm -hmm. since 1900 we are now close up to 9 billion which by the way for whatever reason that nobody can understand just google look up the collapsing global births other words not just here in the west or europe all over the world it doesn't matter which culture there's a collapsing birth rate it's almost like we're running out of people but this gets into and this is controversial so where did these undead come from after a thousand years then the undead and i, I do think that jesus said everybody gets a shot Everybody gets a, a straight, every created being gets a straight up shot to hear the gospel, to use their own free will and make their own mind up. Mm -hmm. So I went and looked, what did Christ do once he, once he was crucified, he went to Sheol. Um, and there's actually like three places that we think all, all is one is hell. One is hell where the rich man went, where there's burning, dip your finger in, and there's a great chasm, but there's also a place called Hades, and I think also a place called Sheol, mm -hmm. and Christ actually went down, and I heard this from one of your other ones. He, set, he classifies the people in three different groups, the righteous, which are like David and the prophets uh, that were in Sheol, that were released right as Christ was re resurrected, more than 500 people basically saw all of these saints get resurrected right then uh, uh they were the, the 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 prophets and david and the, the, those type of people those people who believed and then died uh before christ was actually uh, crucified mm -hmm. then there are the sinners a great block of sinners that are also in sheol and i got the scriptures for it i mean it's a massive amount of people and these were people and sheol for people who don't know it's not like hell it's it's a, like a land of darkness. It's a land where it's like what they call soul sleep. Um, you've heard about that, right, right, mm -hmm. Paul? And then you got hell where like really wicked people went, and you you didn't get that. But 
it talks about um, in so many scriptures, like First Peter 3, 18, 20, uh, when, when Christ went to hell, he promised um, basically another chance. Uh, Jesus went to hell, the heart of the earth. He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Another scripture, three days, three nights, uh, is in the heart of the earth. Isaiah 9, 2, people walked in darkness. They saw a great light who dwelt in the land of deep darkness. Um, and on them shone a great light. And there's uh, other scriptures, other books, in which they say when Jesus went to Sheol, uh, that there, it was such a great light and a throng of people. Jesus was probably 500 foot tall, or they would have ganged him. But they were all crying out, son of Davis, get us the hell out of this place. And so what did Jesus do? He took the righteous mm -hmm. uh, psalm. He brought us out of darkness and the shadow of death uh, and burst our, our bonds apart. Um, well, we dwelt in the region of the shadow of death, uh, uh, and then a great light dawned on us. Um, just a couple of more. Hosea 13, 14. I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall ransom them from death. Ecclesiastics 9, 10. There is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol. Jonah 2, 2, saying, that's the soul sleep I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I called out to the Lord. This is Jonah saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. And he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. I cried uh, and you heard my voice. And then finally, a last one. And there's actually more. Psalm 99, 17. Here's a, here's a really weird one. All right. The wicked shall return to Sheol. Uh, all of the nation's people that forgot God. Uh, and then also the Lord kills and brings to life and brings down to Sheol and raises up again. Mm -hmm. And so here's the thinking, Paul, that we are now it's like the sands of the sea. And, and I think when Jesus went down, he goes, look, the righteous are going to come with me. Meanwhile, there's probably billions of sinners. We're not like the really wicked. Yeah, you know, like we commit adultery and we rip somebody off or whatever, whatever sins that we were engaged in. But when we're like the wicked that we're, you know, sacrificing children, you know, eating people's lives up and this and that, they're, that that's not the same as those who are in hell. And he said to him, look, I'm going to give you all another chance. There's going to be a special age of grace, but you can't do it in my kingdom. Furthermore, I'm going to wipe all of your memories but you are going to get a second chance. And this, this age of grace, which I think the Catholics, they come up with this doctrine called purgatory. It will be during the short season, what we're watching right now, Paul. He says, you got to use your own free will. You, I, you, you expect me to just take you all out of here? Yeah, you believe in me now that I show up, but that's not faith. So I'm going to wipe your memories and I'm going to give you a chance to that's not reincarnation because it's not cycle. I'm going to give you a straight up chance to come in, but you're going to come in during this period of duality when the devil will be loose and you will decide whether you want to go to the dark side or want to go with God, with me, to the light. And this is what I will tell you. And I think I think that was the promise. What, what else, Paul, was he proclaiming to all these people in show except take it easy? Uh, 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 you, you're going to get a second chance. Mm -hmm. what, what else would he say? Releasing the people from prison. Mm -hmm. He didn't release them all. He only took the righteous. So what about the sinners? What about the ones in, in the soul sleep? What do you think of that theory? Or am now, I am now a heretic that believes in reincarnation. Go ahead. Well, look, and we got about five, 10 minutes. Go yeah, ahead. I mean, look, I think to summarize that point, it holds weight because what about the people who lived before Christ? Where was their chance to be saved? You know, and never mind, obviously, you got the sinners who were the murderers and the rapists and all the really, really bad people, sure, you know. But at, at the end of the day, I mean, is one sin worse than another when it really comes to eternal damnation and that concept, you know? I mean, a little bit, we, from our perspective, yes, we judge people based on who, who commits worse sins than others. Absolutely. And, it, and we struggle with that as fleshly people to forgive people who do the worst things, don't we? 
and that's understandable from our perspective um but this, this is the problem with true godly agape love you know and and the love a love of mankind and he, he does want people to come to repentance and change i mean um paul was one of the worst murderers and persecutors of, of christians before he was saved you know um and this is it's a struggle but the, the, to get to summarize that these people who lived before christ even came where's their chance to know the saved redeemed well the little season would make sense of that like i said he, he they were in sheol there and he says you'll get your time you'll get your chance but right now i have a promise to fulfill to those who stayed faithful throughout until the end he came for the saints first you know the martyrs first um and obviously the bosom of abraham as well so if he, he did things in order and it's a time and place for everything. Not everybody can just suddenly come out all at once. I think that's that's the idea. I think it has to be the, the right timing. And it's in God's timing, the right time and place. And right now, this is a perfect world he created before he left, where there is the choice between good and evil. Good things happen in this world, but bad things happen too. You know, And it's, uh, it's kind of which side do you want to be on? Which master will you serve? You can't serve two masters. And that choice can easily be made here in this dualistic principled society that we have today uh it living squatting in the remnants of a, of a just society he built and i think maybe like i said the testimony of of his kingdom through these buildings shows that we if we strive for beauty we, we can create um heaven on earth the new jerusalem ourselves or we did at least once do that and i think that's why these buildings do remain in some way it gives us that ability to understand there's beauty in this world and then there's misery and pain and sin as well which one do you want to which one do you want to be a part of? Absolutely. I, I, I can see all that. And I do think, again, I'm not saying for 100% certain that we are the resurrected dead. I don't know that. It does say in Revelations, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years had ended. It doesn't say when exactly. It could be at the end of the little season or the start. I'm going to assume it's the start because the intense, insane population boom that happened in the 1700s, 1800s out of nowhere. You know, it seems to me something needs to explain that in some way. And this kind of does tie in nicely with it. Um, again, it isn't re I'm not trying to support reincarnation in any way shape or form i think it's resurrection at appointed times through god's will and his choice not an endless cycle i don't think you die and then your spirit just floats around into the next baby you can find and just suddenly inhabits that one or something you know i think it's it could be more of a you can you get one chance or maybe three strikes i don't know exactly who am i i'm not god you know who am i to make those choices Someone in the comments here is saying they disagree because obviously if a baby dies, they get to go straight to heaven straight away. Maybe that is the case too, and I'm completely off base here and wrong. I'm not trying to upset anybody who may. Yeah, well, that's what the but... that's what the Catholics believe. I, I got a wife that's a Catholic, and they believe that yeah. right around the glory, right around the uh, over top of the glory of God, mm -hmm. there are millions and millions, maybe a billion little babies that have been aborted or infants yeah. that have been killed. And they're like circling. There'd be so many of them. God's glory couldn't even get past all the little babies with angels floating by. I don't believe that at all. No. I think he's given everybody a straight up shot. I really do believe maybe. that. Well, as, as a parent myself of a young child, you know, the, the thought of losing him is the worst possible thing I can imagine. And I'm not here to disparage anybody who's lost a child i i could not even imagine the pain of that you know and and i know i know it's comforting to know that maybe they're in heaven now or safe and they 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 don't have to be judged in any way so i understand that and i'm not trying to take that away because i'm i don't know okay and as a parent myself i'm not trying to i, I get it i get it you know i really do um and but, but one thing stepping out of my emotions on this and trying to think logically about it um perhaps it is a if that's the case then perhaps you know it was a mercy of god for them to be killed because they get to them not be judged and safe you could argue and try and square it in your mind that way in some ways god working all evil things for good and um, we think it's evil that all these abortions are happening maybe that's god allowing evil people to do that evil act so he can then save them you know instead trying to because they were always going to murder the babies but jokes on them now those babies are saved forever who knows you know it's pure wild speculation for me and to justify it but i think it would be more than likely as an as a, as a soul to save us for eternity and get us into the kingdom in the end and to purify us through fire in that pure godly purification type of fire perhaps it is a case that when we die no matter what age if you die before the chance to make a choice you're going to have to come back until you can make the choice. 
You know, I, I it's one of the. I, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm. Purely, oh, I think that's it. I'm purely speculating here. You know, and and that's what I do. I. I, I don't want to be caught off guard when whatever happens does happen. I like to think <laughs> I like to think things yeah, as, well, as thoroughly well, think as possible. About this new, yeah, think about this new information we're coming into. With, with it's the people are like the sands of the sea. It's the little town of Satan. Mm -hmm. Do a, do a, do your research and look up um, Sheol and Hades, and you'll see. Wait a minute, he's talking about rescuing people, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, and and the ones that don't don't make it, they get thrown back in so um but before we got we all i only got like half my notes paul we're gonna have to do this again but uh <laughs> i mean i never got to like the 1300s there was a little ice age yeah. well noah and um uh noah and nasa uh, one of them they just did some thermal imaging of antarctica to find out where the land was actually underneath the ice wall and we got these old maps which got you know uh, castles and some civilizations even in antarctica and shows the, the 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 way the land went well when they lined up the thermal imaging it showed right with the that these old maps were actually correct and so now i'm starting to think that this little ice age in the 1300s that's when access to the arctic uh probably new jerusalem was sealed off with mm. the great uh, ice ring around it and the same within the Antarctic. So anyways, so many notes I got to, but <laughs> before I go, um, uh, before I let you go and we, we, we close this thing down, I need to tell everybody, look, Paul's 31, young family, talented, good at what he does. I have watched guys. Oh, and the reason why no support, the only way you're going to get more of this kind of thing is you're going to have my day's over. Ah, I'm too shot up. I was political. I've been locked up. I'm, I don't even have the cape. You could give me a million dollar check and I couldn't even cash it. That's how banged up I am. But Paul, he's the hope. Maybe he will do a book. If he gets enough support, maybe he can do a whole in-depth book on the, the second coming. That's my hope. And in fact, I'm going to try to get my notes together and well, it's all handwritten stuff because I'm scared to put stuff on the computer because I know people are looking at the computer. Anyways, you got to support Paul. He's got this book. The Nephilims look like clowns. I've been to that world. Uh, listen, it, it is, it's psychedelic, bright colors. It's like wicked. It's like, it, it's, it's otherworldly. There, there's no, uh, I, there's no way I can even describe it. Terror. And it's also terrifying, but so go to con understanding conspiracy, um, dot com and, you know, well, Paul, tell us where they, where they can actually get a pre-ordered book or where they can give you a donation. That's really what you need. You need somebody to say, you know what, I'm going to support this guy because Paul's right on it. He's trafficked in all of these conspiracy theories from the Mandela effect, the Y2K. He knows it. He knows it. And he's better than I am. He's quicker than I am, believe it or not. I over them because I wanted to get this stuff out. So I was, guess I was kind of rude. But anyway, so Paul, let people know where they... they they can support you and, and as we as we close this out real quick okay I mean, first of all you weren't you weren't rude um i'm all for the conversation i want to learn too to be honest i'm sick of talking myself i was i'm sick of my own voice so thank you for teaching me a thing or two with this talk and that's why i came here today because you said you wanted to share something with me and i'm absolutely here for it so thank you you've given me a lot to think about so i really appreciate it um, if you if you guys want to support me, um, you can easily do that by sending me a PayPal donation. That is an option. Um, but the best way to really support me is to become a regular patron donator. I do try and offer extra things on there for just $5 a month. Uh, that is more of a consistent monthly payment for me if YouTube does decide to one day just shut me down and all the ad revenue goes. I mean, I, I, don't get me wrong, this is the channel's grown quite a lot. Um, over the past few months and I am making a decent enough living now as a self-employed content creator for me and my family um, but there is always that risk that it could just be instantly removed and that's why Patreon really is the best way to support me in, in a solid foundational way I am writing a book which hopefully will feed me and my family for many years to come once it's published but who knows about that you know as an extra fail safe um, you can find all the links to support the book in any description on any of my videos 
videos all the links are there including my email if you want to send me any information uh, links to paypal links to patreon and links to the go fund me for the book coverage and support um, so that's probably all i could say on that yeah well god bless you paul and let's let's try to do it again sometime i'm going to keep on pirating your stuff i've stole <laughs> a lot of stuff from you i have to admit over the last over the last couple of months in fact you can see your fingerprints all, all through everything that we talked about tonight uh, even the format even, even ripped off your format you know by painting the story from the beginning to the end so um no but problem. anyways i'm okay with that that's fine yeah but but uh paul paul's our hope out there and so uh you got just to support them that's the that's the next generation um and so anyways you are listening to you know the uh, revolution radio we are the largest listener supported uh uh, internet volunteer listener supported uh, other words not backed by like commercials and that type of thing so it's a qualifier you actually have bigger ones like alex jones and that type of thing but as far as listener supported we do we have reach all over the world with this so uh if you can support revolution radio we need help i think we're getting uh, a new server and then row real quick before i sign off uh you're going to start put seven platforms at one time. What what are you doing on the, on the, 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 the IT and uh, uh, on, uh, oh, what do you call it? Uh, on your end, what, what, what Revolution Radio is doing? Yeah, yeah we need a server yeah. or something. I don't, so, I'm not, know, in, yeah, we've I'm got not in management. We got a system set up now, well, we, a proof of concept that we've already done the prototyping on, and we need a, a server that can actually handle video because we've always been an audio shop. But basically, it's it's going to go out to several different platforms all simultaneously. The host doesn't have to do anything but opt in, um, and then we handle everything uh, in-house. Uh, it's all automatic, and they can even share their screens like with Skype. Uh, and it automatically will go out to, you know, like X and Rumble and all the different platforms that are out there. Um, and then it'll also be archived. So, um, and we're working on also uh, the second phase will maybe we'll have some sort of broadcast on demand function, things like that. And we're going to always be streaming uh, something on, on our website. We're going to probably do a little bit of revamp on that. So, but right now we're trying to raise about $1,300 for a new streaming server. And uh, once we have that, we've got enough hosts that are interested that we'll kick that off. That's that. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, Paul, um, think about it because we do have slots opened up, even if it's pre-recorded, like, like sort of like what we're doing right now, because you have a, a Q and answer session, therapy for truthers. Mm -hmm. And that helps us all in our, our madness and all the dark stuff that we have to work through. Uh, they come together and it's more of a, Q and A or ask Paul anything type of thing. So think about Paul finding a spot, getting getting uh, host controls and Revolution Radio, because there's open spots, especially you being from the UK and the time difference, so that you could actually put it up once a week. So just just think about that if you could. And um, oh, uh, anything else, Paul? And God bless you. You're very authentic. I really do appreciate it. Um, but is there anything else before I close this out? Um, I will definitely consider joining the radio and, and sure you can use any of my um, previous podcasts or anything that I do because I usually go for two hours at a time myself and then some if I uh, get a bit carried away. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm more than happy to share that with you guys and help flesh out the show and um, help support you any way I can. If anyone's listening on my end right now because I've, um, I've had about 1,400 views of this video so far that we've just done. Um, and I've got 263 people here now, apparently. So if anyone's listening, go and support this radio. Give you know, help them out. This is this is this is what we do. We network. We support each other. We are one community, despite our differences in opinions and theology or worldviews. We're all just trying to find the truth at the end of the day. So support these guys as well. Yeah, and that's one thing I can say about Paul. He's very gracious with all his hosts. Uh, he's got people that do artwork, and he he shares links, all that stuff. A lot of guys that hold back or they'll quote somebody and they won't attribute this or they won't tell them where they got it. Paul's not like that. He's a straight shooter. So anyways, uh, and you you should get a good spike 
uh, I believe it or not, I've been around the talk radio for about 14 years, Paul. So there's going to be a lot of people that are actually recognize the hijacker's name. But with that being said, this is the most important thing. Uh, the true reality of this earth. I am the hijacker over and out. I hope you enjoyed that little show there, guys. Though they they've left now uh, the Skype, um, but yeah, that was that was a great talk. I I enjoyed that, and it's it's good to connect with people, um, who are a little bit you know, from all over the, all over the world basically, who have their own versions and platforms. Uh, I think Re Revelation Re Revolution Radio isn't necessarily a Christian based uh, radio show, but the host you just heard, Hijacker, is obviously a Christian man himself, and a lot of what he shares is Christian foundational based. So as you heard, I may end up uh, sharing a lot of my Q&A sessions or my Truth or Therapy sessions onto their slots on their show, so that should be good. That's some good news for the channel to help it grow. Uh, thanks for being here, guys. Thanks for, for listening. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, we'll have plenty more interviews coming soon. I'm talking with Tony at God Rules. We've rearranged that for Tuesday. Um, we had a bit of a scheduling issue, so we had to cancel our Friday session and then move that to uh, next Tuesday. So that's going to be happening as well. Um, I'm in talks with Shelly right now to try and arrange another time as well. And I think that's going to be at the back end of March. But I do have plenty of shows coming up as well. This weekend, I am on a podcast talking about the Nephilim looking like clowns. I'll be streaming that tomorrow night, 8 p.m. UK time. That's 3 p.m. Eastern time. And also, let me just check my calendar here see what else I've got going on. I've got... Um, I'm talking with Bo from uh, the Bump Podcast as well. I'll be talking with him on Sunday. He's going to join me for a Truth or Therapy session. And on towards that, tomorrow, it's uh, Truth to Faith Podcast to talk about the Nephilim look like clowns. So this weekend's going to be good fun. And next weekend, I have George Hobbs of the Fact Hunter Podcast joining me for a Truth or Therapy session as well. But I'm going to have to get going, guys. I've got some messages popping in. Thanks for listening. And as always, God bless.